a second to take this cafe. Yes, I, and I do know I, I do know exactly who has and who has not completed it, but I don't know what the seventeen people have written about the course and me yet. But I do know who hasn't done it, and no, I will not tell you who has not yet completed it. But somebody just admitted that they have yet to complete it, and so if you listen carefully, you might hear some of those conversations. All right, um, let me uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. <laughs> Father, I know speaking from uh, experience and the way that I'm currently feeling that this is a, a, a difficult time of the semester. Father, I pray that uh, you would just I encourage us, encourage us to endure through uh, the hard uh, days and, and, and weeks ahead. And Father, to not just to, to get through it, but to, uh, to, to thrive, uh, to, uh, to produce uh, results that we would be happy with and you would be glorified by. And I pray that as that becomes our goal, uh, that, Father, everything else would, would kind of fade uh, behind that ultimate goal of you being glorified by the, way, um, by the way we labor and work. And Father, I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So we are going to finish up chapter 20 today and then on Friday we will begin our time with our quiz and then we will start applying concepts from chapter 20 specifically to the fossil record and to say okay well let's take a phylogeny and put it on top of here and, and see what we can actually do with that and and what explains this uh, better but as we finish up uh, chapter 20 we, we get to talk about some fun things first uh, we're going to talk about how do you even tell if a feature is homologous or analogous how do you tell? How do you know? Uh, and therefore, you know, how would you know what to do with that uh, in a phylogeny? We'll talk about how do you build phylogenies. And then lastly, we'll talk about horizontal gene transfer and how it makes everything a little interesting. All right. So how can you tell if a feature is homologous uh, or analogous? The reality is uh, a lot of this is assumed. And I put some of this uh, is assumed. But, but in reality, I, 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 I didn't want to come off sounding like a jerk, so I put some of it as assumed. But it's really all of it's assumed. Um, you know, there, there are clues and bits of information that you can take and interpret as being, you know, either homologous or analogous. But a lot of it is just based on uh, certain assumptions. So here are some of these clues. Uh, if it develops in the same way at the same time or the same point in development... Uh, it might be homologous. And so if you've got two structures or the same structure that you find in two different organisms and it develops in the same way at the same point in development, it does provide some evidence in favor of it being homologous. That is coming from the same ancestry because it seems like if they're developing in the same way and they're building that structure uh, at the same time, uh, that it would make sense that they developed those uh, features from the same ancestor. However, you got some interesting issues here. Uh, bipedalism. So walking on two legs versus four. When you compare a bipedal marsupial, like a kangaroo, to a bipedal placental mammal, like a human, you find that the structure, skeletal structure, develops in a similar way at pretty much the same point in development. But I don't think anybody would say that bipedalism in kangaroos and humans is homologous, which would mean that we would both have to go back to a bipedal ancestor. So it does get a little bit interesting. That's why I say it may, uh, might be homologous. Uh, if it's structured in the same way and has the same function, so it's not just carrying out the same function, but it's also structured in the same way, uh, it might be homologous. So it develops in the same way at the same point in development if it's structured the same way and functions in the same way, these are all clues that it, it, it might be homologous, uh, root back to the same ancestor. Another one getting into some uh, reference to the molecular information. Uh, if the gene that actually codes for whatever that structure is, is, is similar in sequence, and is found basically in the same place on the chromosome, it's a good indication that this is homologous. So if what's actually providing the code that you need to make that structure 
And if that code is found in the same place in the genome and is pretty similar in sequence, it's a good indication that it's a homologous uh, feature. Yeah. One for analogous, uh, if it's better explained by convergence, uh, than it is by common ancestry, then we would assume that that was an analogous feature and not a homologous feature. So if it's better explained by convergence than it is by common ancestry. So these are things that would give you clues as to how you would make that determination. Here's the problem. It's very rarely done that way. Here's how it's usually done. If the organisms do share ancestry, so if you assume they share ancestry, then you would say that the feature is homologous. And so that's how it's usually done. And um, yeah, so you can go into, you know, trying to find some clues as to helping us to understand whether or not it's homologous. But really, it, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't really matter most of the time. Because most of the time you assume the relationships are the way you assume they are. And so if it makes sense for it to be homologous, then you consider it to be a homologous structure. So it obviously matters in terms of if you're trying to build a phylogeny. And let's use kangaroos and humans as an example again. Okay, so you've got, thank you. You've got uh, kangaroos that are bipedal, humans are bipedal, and so if you assume that that is homologous, then you would have to assume that we share a more recent ancestor with kangaroos than we do with something that's quadrupedal, like a chimpanzee, which is quadrupedal. That's kind of interesting. And then so you have to start weighing characters and to say, okay, well, that really doesn't make sense because we have more characters in common with a chimpanzee than we do with a kangaroo, and therefore, you know, bipedal must be an analogy, bipedalism. Um, and so it really becomes a game of what fits the story better. And it all roots back to kind of this idea of, of maximum parsimony. And I've mentioned that before. I'm going to mention it again. And I'll mention it again today, uh, that idea of maximum parsimony. And it's basically whatever requires the fewest number of evolutionary steps, whatever is the simplest answer, that's what's probably true. That's the idea of maximum parsimony. Whatever requires the fewest number of evolutionary steps, whatever is the simplest sequence of events, that's what's probably true. So if kangaroos and humans had a more recent ancestor than kangaroos and chimpanzees, then you would need to start explaining all of those examples of convergence, which really isn't an issue if you don't think humans and chimpanzees share an ancestor at all, and you don't think humans and kangaroos share an ancestor at all. All these examples of convergence are explained in the same way. But if that's not your view of origins, you have an issue. And so it's, it's a matter of what makes the most sense, what's the simplest, fewest number of steps. <sighs> All right, so here's some examples. Uh, here are, uh, the idea here is you're looking at homologous structures in the wings of birds and in the wings of bats. Uh, they are both tetrapods. Uh, they are both amniotes. And so the idea here is that the bones that make up their, their forelimbs that are modified into wings come from the same ancestry. Uh, and what you can see is they develop in similar ways at a similar point in development. They're structured in similar ways. They function in similar ways. The genes that code for what happens are similar in sequence, and they're found in similar places on the chromosome. And so you, you have some evidence that these are homologous structures. You also have some issues. Yeah? Do, like, all amniotes have that kind of structure in their, like, limbs? You So are you asking, could you trigger any amniote to develop wings? No, so, like, you, so you're saying, like, well, so these two are both amniotes, and they both have the same structure. Yep. Or it's homologous. Yeah. But if I grab another random amniote, is, is any amniote I pick up going to, like, match this? Or are these a little bit Yeah, they're going to have a lot of similarities. So you can see in the, in the forearm of yeah. the bat, which is, is part of the wing, you've got two bones, the radius and the ulna. You have that same thing in most of your birds. Some birds, the radius and the ulna are fused into a single bone. Okay. But in most birds, you have two distinct bones, right? So, like, if you're eating chicken wings, you've got two types, right? You've got the little drumette that's the humerus, and then you've got the two-bone portion, the radius and the ulna. 
And so you have similar structures. And any given amniote it is, is going to be pretty likely to have a very similar forearm structure. Now, there are obviously some differences if you're going to modify it into a wing versus something like our four limbs, but there are a lot of structural similarities as well. And the answer to your unasked question that I asked for you, could you trigger any amniote to actually develop wings? The answer to that is probably yes. Yeah. Now, could you accomplish flight? That's a biomechanical problem and not the problem of not having wings. So, so here are homologous versus analogous structures. So when you take the wings of an insect, they're carrying out the same function as the wings of a bat and the wings of a bird, right? Being used in flight, being used to generate lift, to overcome the weight of the animal. But there is a big difference in the way they are structured. The wings of an insect is just the cuticle. It's the same exoskeleton that covers the rest of the body, but it just grows out. It starts to form little um, outgrowths, and then those grow and extend, and it's just an extension of the cuticle. Structured in a very different way, develops in a very different way, uh, functions in a similar way, and then the genetic makeup to actually do it is co completely different. Okay, so some clues uh, that it is not uh, homologous at all and is instead an analogous structure. Okay, that makes sense? Homologous versus analogous. Obviously, it matters, but then there's the question of, well, what do you actually do uh, with that information? And we'll deal with that. All right, so our next framing question. How should we actually build phylogenetic trees? How should we actually build them? How should we actually build them? First thing, you need to remember uh, that the goal of a phylogenetic tree is basically the same goal that you have in taxonomy. Continue to make your group smaller and smaller, more and more exclusive, until you get to a point where you have a, a group that contains a single type of life. Right? That's the goal of taxonomy. That's the goal of organizing files on your computer if you are an organized person. If you're not, there is no goal. It's just chaos. Right? And you operate inside that chaos with you know, varying amounts of success. Uh, but the goal of that, the goal of any organization scheme is to get your group smaller and smaller, more and more exclusive until you narrow it down to a single type of life. Okay? That's a goal of phylogenetics. That's a goal of trees. Another goal is that you're trying to illustrate the relationships. Whereas with taxonomy, I mean, you're sort of doing that. Like if you put two genera in the same family, you are saying something that, about that relationship. But in phylogenetics, you're saying something very specific, right? You're saying if you have two sister taxa, they share an ancestor, right? And then if you have a sister taxon to those two together as a single branch, you're saying they share an ancestor. So you're saying something very specific about the relationships, okay? A little bit uh, of a different story of what you're trying to accomplish in taxonomy. So those are what you're trying to do. And then you have to find some balance between readability and accuracy. And so um, the horrible phylogeny I showed you last time from the text, and it's coming back today, but in a different form. Because not only did they do it once, but they did it twice and just in different formats. Super readable, right? Super readable, a little confusing, and this one is still confusing, but super readable. But the accuracy, it's just strange. It's like, why would you go to that level of detail in a single branch? Uh, but you have to kind of find this balance. So it's like, yeah, if you want to be really accurate and represent every single group, let's say you wanted to build a phylogeny for amniotes, going back to amniotes, um, and you want to build a phylogeny for all amniotes. And so your goal is to keep branching and branching and branching until you cannot get into any smaller group, which is eventually going to get to a point where every population is represented by a branch. That's going to be a lot of branches. It's going to be a really complicated tree. Yeah, it's going to be super accurate, maybe, uh, if, in fact, you think that all amniotes do root back to a single ancestor, because if you don't, then that would not be a very accurate tree and would be better represented by an orchard. Anyways, another discussion for another time. So it may be really accurate, but it would not be very readable, right? Your branches would be tiny. You'd just have so much information in there. It'd be really difficult to operate inside of a phylogeny like that. Okay, so you have to kind of find this balance. Yeah, Joey. Okay, so if a phylogeny is basically an attempt to take uh, 
information about what relationships we see and present them. Isn't any phylogeny a biased presentation of information? Because like they can, you could make a phylogeny that like made evolution look really good, but you may wouldn't have like made it look really bad. And, like, um. Well, bad. if you build your phylogeny well, it should not be subject to your bias because you should use every character at your disposal. And so you shouldn't be able to manipulate it beyond what 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 are actually there. You shouldn't be able to manipulate it beyond what the data you have. Um, you may have to m interpret the data in some ways to actually build the tree. But yeah, I mean, you have to realize to root a tree, you have to assume that you have a group that's closely related to those in the phylogeny, but not part of it, right? And so you, you already are assuming universal common descent to build a phylogeny. Yeah. But if you're doing a smaller phylogeny, like let's say you're just going to do a phylogeny of all the populations of, I don't know, all of Ridley sea turtles. Why all of Ridley sea turtles? Because they're awesome. Okay. And so let's say you're going to do a phylogeny that represents all of those populations. Uh, is, it, is it absurd to assume that all of those populations root back to a single all of Ridley individual or individual pair? Maybe. Um, but it seems to be not that big of a stretch right and so uh if you if you go and you and you do that um you shouldn't have to infer too much about the data to where it actually makes it um to where you're applying a lot of your bias yeah i mean no science is free of bias but we should be able to model some things in such a way that we minimize that if that makes sense all right so let's talk about some of the data so molecular data, these would be like DNA sequences. They would be protein sequences, you know, sequence of amino acids uh, that make up a protein, um, provide a, a more objective picture. And, and we, we hinted at this uh, when Joey and I had a conversation a, few, a couple of months ago, probably, of where you know, it makes sense that he and his siblings should be more closely related genetically than he and I should because they have a more recent common ancestor. Right? And I know I keep going back to that, and you're probably tired of Joey and I's moments. Um, but, but alas, it's still a, a great illustration. And so it does provide a more objective picture. However, there are some limitations. One, uh, it's limited to organisms that have DNA, RNA, or protein samples, meaning it's pretty difficult to use it on fossils because the chances of you accessing any of this information is really, really low. And so you're limited in terms of what you can use molecular data on. Another limitation uh, is it assumes that mutation rates are constant. And this is interesting. So we talked about mutations being one of those uh, factors or one of those forces of microevolutionary change. Uh, in order to actually use molecular data, you have to assume that that mutation rate is constant which is interesting because we have some data that would suggest otherwise. That mutation rates are not constant, uh, vary from organism to organism, and even vary from gene to gene. That some genes are what you would call hot spots, likely to mutate, and others are not. Uh, it's also subject to inconsistencies. What you find is if you use one gene, it may tell a different story than if you use a different gene. So for instance, um, let's say, uh, gosh, I don't know. Let's say we're going to use like the gene for if you are to, you know, take your hands and put them together, which one of your thumbs ends up on top? Okay. It actually, it conforms really well to typical Mendelian inheritance patterns, which we'll talk a lot more about next semester, uh, and, and is likely the result of, of one or just a, a, a couple of genes. So let's say we, we, we were talking about that gene versus, I don't know, one of the genes that contribute to eye color, okay? So if you were to take the genes that contribute to eye color and compare me with my siblings, you would find something very interesting. My eye color is nothing like my siblings' eye color. It's very much like my parents. And so you'd find probably some pretty big differences in that gene that contributes to eye color when you compare my brother and I. But when you compare this, my brother and I both end up with our left thumb on top, which is, of course, the better way to do it because that's the way I do it. And so when you compare that 
you would find something more similar. And so sometimes you have some inconsistencies in what's going on, right? And so you can have, if you, I mean, even if you are distantly related from somebody, but you have a very similar hair color to them, a very similar eye color, some of your genes may be more similar than what you would expect otherwise because of the distance of your relatedness. Or if you both have the same genetic illness, probably caused by the same mutation in your gene. And you may not be closely related at all, and yet your genetics are going to tell a different story. All right, morphological data. Uh, these provide an easier picture to interpret. Uh, molecular data, when you, when you have phylogenies built on molecular data, your synapomorphies, it's, it's just it's strange. Do you remember that term, synapomorphy? Shared, derived feature? It's like, okay, well, this, this gene is 7,000 bases long. Am I going to write that the synapomorphy is that they both share a T at the 6,975th lo location? That's not as... It's not as comfort as he's saying, like, the synapomorphy is they both have mitochondria. So this is limited to organisms that we have studied. And the reason why I put this is a lot of organisms are known only by their DNA. So there are a lot of um, prokaryotic organisms that we have never seen, never studied in a lab. But when you're just sampling the ocean for whatever's there we have found a sequence that doesn't match to anything else and is obviously an organism we've never studied before. Okay, well, it, you can't use morphological features for that organism because you don't know what it looks like. All you have are its genetics. Uh, morphological data oftentimes assumes homology, right? If, if, if a structure is built in the same way at about the same time and carries out the same function, you're going to assume homology, uh, which may not necessarily be the case. Uh, and then this one is also more subject to bias. And this is where you have to make decisions of what's more difficult to develop. You know, like this whole kangaroo, human, chimpanzee issue. And you're like, okay, well, we are bipedal, kangaroos are bipedal. We, we are bipedal, chimpanzees are not bipedal. All right? But the way we develop our, uh, our uteri is similar to the way chimpanzees develop their uteri. We have similar ecological features, and so you have to make decisions, okay, well, what's more complicated to develop more than once? All right, so those are some of the data that we use, and, and we're going to take our lecture break now. Uh, and during this lecture break, as you are in a group of six slash seven slash eight with a discussion leader, I'm going to want you to, to talk about this. How could you design the absolute best tree possible? What would you use as characters? So would you use morphological? Would you use molecular? Uh, and then how would you make decisions as far as if there are some discrepancies, which, which tree would you choose? Because oftentimes if you go to assemble a tree, you get multiple possible trees. And then so how would you figure out the one that's best? Okay, so go through talking in your group of six slash seven slash eight and come up with some rules or some guidelines that you would use to make the best possible phylogenetic tree. All right, go ahead and take three minutes, starting now. I can read. Yes. Cool. All right. Oh. Well, first you've got to get... All right, guys. So how we build a phylogenetic tree, what are some of the parameters, uh, how we choose a tree when we produce more than one good looking tree. Um, you got to get the 20 pack of critical crayons to start it off. Got to make that thing colorful. Colorful? It's helpful that folks I think morphological traits would probably be Morphological? Yeah. You do it based on that. All, all the time? Uh, for a majority of things. Like, because we can study fossils and stuff like that and assume what they kind of look like, which is why you have to assume things in the tree. And so, as a Christian, I think morphological. I can think of examples where okay. morphologically, a tree based on morphology turned out to be, turned out to be Like, uh, pachyderms, 
Mm -hmm. It used to be believed that rhinoceroses, elephants, and hippopotamus are all related. And it actually turns out not to be so like privileged animals. And then I'm also thinking about sperm whales and other tooth whales okay. that are not actually that closely related. They do have a relation. They're closer related to dolphins, sperm whales are, okay. than to the baleen whales. Okay. However, they're two different. Well, then you could do a tree based on. You wouldn't want to do it based on more than three. Okay. Um, you can probably I'd just stick the thing. Use a combination. Yeah, so like equality. You can't ignore more. No, you can't ignore that, but you can't ignore it. For me, I think that so whatever was simplest, maybe? Yeah, yeah, whatever simplest. Is. Yeah. yeah, so things that, are, that give you the simplest tree, and also I would add the least amount of polytones. Yeah, exactly. That's what Least amount of polytones and less of a jump, more of an easier step. Mm -hmm. Which even that can be uh, misleading because maybe the true tree does in fact have a lot of polytones because they limited you to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or something really strange happened in the development of the species, and it is possible that it was more difficult. So it's not even that's not always the best way to go. But sometimes it is. And like a tree too, if you had polytones, it definitely depends on where you were coming from, like your viewpoint on how things actually were created. So like you're coming from a Christian perspective, anything that has a fault in you can be like, okay, where does these, where do these actually come from? And if you don't know, like, as a Christian, you can probably group those by themselves if it, if they don't have, like, an ancestor that you can find with all morphologically or genetically or anything like that. Because at that point, it's like, okay, God might have created these both. Right. And they just never actually... Polytomies don't always... Uh, Okay. Polytomies don't always indicate a break in the tree. I mean, yes. uh, it can, All right. It so can. as we uh, as we start listing corporately some of the rules and some suggestions for making a phylogeny as good as it can possibly be, it would be very, very helpful for not only you to write those ideas down, but to give some kind of indication of the value of doing that just a suggestion mm -hmm. all right do we have a group that wants to start giving us some rules some guidelines that make for good trees all right we're going to start up here we'll start up here and we'll move our way back and then we'll come back over to this side here that's cool that's about what we talked about all right so I, I said that to me that these trees can always be really confusing sure so by using like the most simple um, like changes or no changes in genes, uh, like species going through certain changes throughout their um, uh, throughout history, like if one hasn't gone through, I don't know if this makes sense. If one hasn't gone through as much change, then maybe that's easier to use in a tree than the one who's okay. gone through a ton of change. Yeah, and so a a good phylogeny, a rule for a good phylogeny, you choose branches that are roughly similar morphologically, right? That don't have wildly different forms yeah it's good i like it yeah and that's um that's that's one of the things that you find is uh, simpler phylogenies tend to be based on on organisms that are more similar yeah that's that i would i would say is is a pretty good idea with regards to building as good a phylogeny as possible now it's obviously going to limit you to only being able to do phylogenies with you know a few organisms that are roughly similar uh, but it is it, it is a good idea. Have some ideas back here. Um, we just kind of talked about how it would be hard to choose, like if you're going to use um, morphological features and DNA and a fossil record all together, you, it could be very difficult to bias because you, like an evolutionist, would want to pair things together that are related. But he might use different different methods for his like making his making an excuse, I guess, like say, okay, these are more Yes, yeah, so you do have to figure out how to weigh. If you're going to use multiple different character types, um, so I, I got from there, if you're going to use molecular and morphological, which is a good idea, if you're going to build a really good tree that has a 
high probability of being an accurate tree, you're going to want to use both. Mm -hmm. But you're going to need to figure out how to weigh those and to say which is more important, that they're similar genetically or that they have a similar structure. Um, and the way you would try to weigh those is by using, you know, probabilities and say, okay, well, if two people have the same structure, what's the probability that they're, that the gene for that has this level of similarity? And then versus doing the opposite. You know, if their genes have this level of similarity, what's the probability that their structures are going to have this level of similarity? So, yeah, it does force you to kind of figure out how to weigh things. And that does introduce some level of bias, but there are good reasons why you would provide different weights to different characters. Yeah. Are you all one group back there? Six slash seven slash ten. Okay. What are some of your ideas? You, you ought to have some good ideas if you had some extra brains. Okay. Okay, so starting with a polytomy or starting with multiple trunks? Multiple trunks, okay. So starting with multiple trunks, um, giving you the best um, phylogeny possible. And obviously that idea is heavily influenced by a particular view of origins, which I'm not, I'm not against. Just I think some people would argue that that probably would not give you the best phylogeny possible but all right have some ideas here yeah um so we mentioned two things um each branch uh having a different um trait thank you okay and then um i was i don't know if this makes sense but i think you should consider like ancestral features because you could like um with each organism you could like try to make similarities and differences sure and separate them that way yeah and so, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a good point in there. Uh, and we talked about this last time, that you have to realize that unless otherwise noted, the plesiomorphies continue. Those shared ancestral traits continue. And so a good rule of thumb is when you're building a phylogeny, uh, try to only use plesiomorphies that are found in every form. Try to only use plesiomorphies that are found in every form. And so again, those plesiomorphies, those are shared ancestral features. And so what that does is it minimizes the number of groups that have lost a feature because that gets really weird to try to figure out were they ancestrally without that feature or did they have that feature and lose it? Okay, so good rule of thumb is as you're building a phylogeny, try to use only plesiomorphies that appear in every form. You also brought up another point of having making sure every branch has a particular feature you, you, you didn't say trait you said trait and so uh, trait has a very specific meaning if you remember back to when we were talking through i don't know chapter 19 or chapter 18 trait has a very specific meaning it's a particular form of a specific character and so there is something nice there is a, another good rule of thumb for building phylogenies is to keep it simple so that you, you aren't really developing new characters, you're just developing different traits for a particular character. So a character would be something like eye color, or hair color, or I don't the forearms, right? And then different traits would be different forms of that character. And so another rule of thumb is to keep your phylogeny simple so that your synapomorphies aren't necessarily novel structures. They're not structures that didn't appear before. They're just different forms of it. And this is kind of what you all were saying up here of, you know, keep your, your branches representing organisms that are roughly similar morphologically. And so what's interesting is when you start applying those, you realize that the absolute best phylogenies are those that are done on a single species and are just comparing populations. Those are the cleanest. Okay, which makes sense because those are the most likely to actually represent common descent, right? If you've got several populations of the same species, probably the most likely to represent common descent from a 
single breeding pair or a single group of that species. So some other good rules of thumb is to use both morphological and molecular data when possible and weigh molecular data more heavily than morphological. Provide it more weight than morphological characters because it just, it, it makes sense, right? If, if they're more similar genetically, that should have more meaning than having a similar uh, structure or the presence of the same structure. <coughs> So yeah, use both molecular and morphological characters, but weigh molecular characters more heavily. Another good rule of thumb is to use multiple molecular characters to help to eliminate the issue with inconsistencies. Right? We said molecular data are subject to inconsistencies. Well, the more characters you use, the more you should be able to control for that. Right? And then you can say, okay, well, this percentage of molecular characters tell this story, and this percentage tell this story. And then the last big rule of thumb that nobody mentioned that I've mentioned previously and I told you I would mention again today is make sure your phylogeny is, is based or built on maximum parsimony. There are different strategies by which you choose the best tree, um, and, and the one that tends to work the best uh, is maximum parsimony. So again, that's the one that requires the fewest number of branching events and therefore would be the simplest way to tell that story. Okay, so the one that requires the fewest number of branching events, the simplest way to tell that story. Those are some good rules of thumbs, rules of thumb as you are building phylogeny, not rules of thumbs, rules of thumb. Do you know the origin of the, that, that statement? You used to be able to beat your wife or your children with anything smaller than the width of your thumb. I'm assuming you could beat your, your slaves as well. Anything that was considered to be your property. Is that horrible? I'm sorry for using that, uh, that statement. All right, so here's the phylogeny again. Uh, again, horrible phylogeny. And this one is way worse than the first time they presented. So you still, you're getting way too specific for trying to represent this amount of diversity where you're using a rabbit to basically represent, oh, this is covering up human, mm. by the way. So rabbit is representing all non-human mammals. Lizard is representing all non-mammal uh, amniotes. Fish are representing all non-amniote vertebrates or all non-amniote fish. Lamprey representing basically all non-fish vertebrates, not all jawed fish, and then lancelet representing all non-vertebrate chordates. And so it's just, it's very, it's a very strange way of doing things. So that's, that's an issue. Also, the way they do their groups is very confusing. So basically what this is leading you to think is that fish would be included in this group amniota which is certainly not true, and that lancelets would be included in this group vertebrata, which is certainly not true. And the, the reason why they, they did this is because they wanted to include this portion of the branch as well. But keep in mind, these branches don't represent time and really don't represent specific organisms until you get to a node, until you get to a branching point or you get to the end of the branch, right? That's when it represents specific groups. In the middle, it doesn't represent anything other than a relationship. And so it's silly to do that. This should be here and on, and this should be here and on. Horrible <coughs> phylogenies. This is not the way you make the best phylogeny possible. Yeah? So if you were to make it based on time, would you actually make the whole thing longer? Um, probably so, and you would need to, well, some branches would be longer, some would probably be shorter, but you would need to superimpose it on some kind of a time scale. So usually you would have it placed on top of the geological time scale. And we'll see some of those on Friday um, in terms of interpreting the fossil record. So here, uh, another figure, this one is more helpful. And so another good suggestion uh, as you're building phylogeny is trying to come up with the best one possible uh, is to think very, very long and hard about why you have a polytomy. Think very, very long and hard about why you have a polytomy. 
So it's not necessarily the best strategy to minimize the number of polytomies because the polytomies may be there for a reason. It's you need to think about why are you getting a polytomy, right? Is it because that you, these organisms are not related in the way you think they are or is the polytomy just something that needs to be resolved, okay, with some other data? All right, our last framing question. How does horizontal gene transfer, or HGT, uh, complicate the picture a bit? So how does horizontal gene transfer complicate this? First, let's talk about what horizontal gene transfer is. Uh, it basically happens when one organism donates some DNA to another in the same generation. So it's not giving genetic information to its offspring. It's donating something to somebody in its own generation. So what's interesting about this and how this complicates it is this makes it possible that molecular similarities, that genetic similarities are actually analogous or are convergent and are not homologous, right? Because if I could give you like my gene for something, let's say you had a genetic illness and I do not have that, and I want to give you a proper working form of that gene. Okay. And then so if I gave you that, that would really complicate this whole idea. Now that would obviously not be homologous. We, you wouldn't say we both have the normal form of that gene because we our ancestor had the normal form of that gene and we both come from that ancestor, but instead that's, that's analogous. But it's, it's, it's kind of a strange... Uh, form of analogy. Now, this is really, really common in prokaryotes. Bacteria trade genetic information all the time, constantly, are constantly sharing their DNA with other individuals. And so it actually brings up this question, uh, can we even describe individual species of bacteria? And some would argue, no, we can't, because of the level of horizontal gene transfer that takes place among bacterial individuals that it does make it very complicated to even describe individual species of bacteria. Now, up until probably 20 years ago, uh, people assumed that horizontal gene transfer did not happen in eukaryotes. It was unique uh, to prokaryotes, uh, but here's the problem. We're finding more and more evidence of this uh, happening in eukaryotes. For instance, some examples given from the text and then some from beyond. Uh, text talks about aphids developing their red color from the fungi that they eat, which isn't necessarily unique. Flamingos develop their pink color from the algae they eat. But the aphids aren't just taking the pigment from the fungi and depositing it into their tissues. They're actually taking the gene for making that pigment from the fungi they eat and incorporating it into their genome. So then they can pass it off to their children. So their children that never ate that red fungi can make this red coloration. And it's not like a flamingo that's born white or gray and has to wait until it eats those algae with that pigment to turn pink. These could be born red, having never eaten that fungi, where they developed that from. Uh, transposable elements are mobile genetic elements, and they'll tend to jump out of a chromosome and then jump back into a chromosome in the same nucleus but they can transfer from one cell to another. And what we found is they can actually jump from one organism to another. They found transposable elements move from rice to millet. And so now you've got mobile genetic elements that can actually move uh, between or among different eukaryotic organisms. Some information beyond the text. Although the text talks a little bit about, uh, the, about a tree and its fungal parasite, uh, and how the, the mechanism is unknown, uh, but there's a transfer of genetic material. Uh, we seem to find a lot of evidence of this when we study parasites and their hosts. That hosts tend to have some, par some genes that look like they came from their parasite uh, and vice versa. Viruses can move uh, genes around. And so we actually find this, there's a virus that infects a bacteria that lives in a number of different arthropods. And it looks like this virus has actually pulled 
the gene for Black Widow venom out of Black Widows and given it to different insects, including stink bugs. There are some stink bugs that can make Black Widow venom, and it looks like they got that from the virus transferring that gene to the stink bug, which that's awesome, right? You don't just need to use your stink to ward off would-be predators, but then you can actually use this Black Widow venom to ward off predators, yeah. So would the spread of STDs cause No, so that, I mean, those that are viral, absolutely. I mean, if you're moving a virus from one individual to another, there's a potential to actually move some genes from the first individual to the next. But in terms of moving a pathogen from one individual to another isn't necessarily horizontal gene transfer. It has to also be accompanied by actually taking a copy of your gene and giving it to somebody else. Yeah. So here are the aphids on the right uh, are aphids that have never incorporated the gene from the fungi that they eat. And on the left are aphids that have. You see that beautiful color, right? Red, the absolute best color that God created. Uh, and then the textbook then gets into dealing with the, the biggest and most important example of horizontal gene transfer is the endosymbiosis that happened as far as in the development of eukaryotic cells in the first place. And then they talk about, so there's, that's kind of the idea there. You know, one organism... Uh, consumes another but doesn't eat it, right? Just phagocytize and leave it in its cell. And then their genomes fusing together to form a new and novel organism, a combination of genomes not seen before. And this is in some way an explanation for why do eukaryotes have some bacterial features and some archaeal features or archaean features. And the idea there is you had some archaean and some bacteria fused together in this uh, uh, progression towards getting a eukaryotic cell. And then the text talks about different ideas of how eukaryotes came to be. The nucleus first, which is what I drew on the board for you last time, where you have to develop the nucleus, and then you can develop the mitochondrion and get that wonderful five-way polytomy we know and love from eukaryotes. So that's this idea of the nucleus first. Nucleus develops first in a prokaryotic cell, and then the cell gets mitochondria and finishes its development into a eukaryotic cell. This one is the mitochondrion is first, the nucleus comes later, but either way you have to explain the origin of the nucleus. And then this third hypothesis is an interesting one and a relatively new one, that the eukaryotes are actually the most primitive of all life forms. And prokaryotes, both bacteria and archaeans, are derived eukaryotes that have lost the membrane-bound structures. And that's an interesting one. And then, so you, you can't really tell, because how do we root that tree of all living forms again? What do we use to root that tree? You just kind of use like a, a ball of membrane, right? It's like, here's like a, a membrane surrounding nothing, and this is what we're going to use to root that tree. Well, bacteria looks more like that than a eukaryote does. But what if you rooted the tree with a really complex cell, more complex than any cell of any living form? Then what's going to come up as most primitive is going to be your eukaryote. And so this kind of gets into this whole issue of what do you use to root your tree, right? Because that's what allows you to be able to tell which is more primitive, which came first. All right. Any questions, thoughts, concerns? It's about five minutes before our scheduled end time, but I am out of information and I am tired. So have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.